Hi guys, I hope you are not super tired already. Uh, so my name is Kirill Fidesev, I'm the developer and researcher at Gnosis Chain and Block Scout. Please grab one of our Epsom t-shirts. Uh, so today we plan to discuss the way how we could make self-sustainable bridges in the cross-chain environments. So the plan for today is to cover what bridges do we have at Gnosis Chain, what are the typical costs for operating any kind of bridge in the cross-chain environment, and how bridges could eventually become financially sustainable, and what practical sway did we consider when doing so at the Gnosis Chain. So first of all, the Gnosis Chain is one of the proof of stake EVM side chains, with its main feature being that its native currency XDAI being packed to the DAI token, DAI ERC20 token available at the mainnet. It currently operates on top of two primary bridges deployed between mainnet and Gnosis Chain, which are XDAI Bridge and Omni Bridge. And of course, we also have some few useful and a lot of many in integrations with other third party bridge and solution providers like Hop Protocol, Connect Network, and others. So if you take a deeper look at what XDAI Bridge is and how it works, then actually XDAI Bridge is one of the oldest bridges available out there on the market. So soon it will turn into four years old. The way how it works is that it allows you to deposit some amount of native, some amount of DAI ERC20 tokens on the mainnet. And this will trigger the minting operation of the same amount of bridged XDAI coins which are native to the Gnosis chain. And you could also go backwards in the backward direction by burning some amount of native XDAI coins, which will trigger the withdrawal operation of the same amount of DAI ERC20s in the mainnet. So the XDAI bridge currently holds more than 50 million in DAI tokens of TVL and has been secured by the network of oracles forming the multi sig wallet. The Omni bridge went live almost two years ago. And its main feature is that it allows you to support any ERC20 token out of the box with zero configuration support required. It works in a similar way how XDAI Bridge works in terms of deposits and withdrawals. So you can easily deposit any type of ERC20 on one side, which will trigger the minting operation of the bridged ERC20 representation on Gnosis chain. And you can go backwards the same as you do at XDAI Bridge. So as of today, we currently support more than 330 unique ERC20 tokens. The bridge holds more than 80 million of uh, USD stable coins in TVL and more than 130 million of TVL in other volatile assets. So now let's take a brief look what are the typical costs for operating the bridge today. So I try to come up with the, a short list as possible here. So the first main category is probably related somehow to the development and support costs. Of course, someone needs to pay the team wages. Someone needs to sponsor the security audits for the code base of the bridge. There is also usually some post-deployment maintenance associated with the bridge code base, which should be somehow sponsored and paid off. The second important category is related with the costs of infrastructure, which includes the hosting fees for all sorts and kinds of oracles, validators you have, maybe some user interfaces, monitoring solutions, and some bridges have some specific bridge explorers which we need to support and host somewhere. And this also could include the gas costs for transactions which are being sent for by our validators or oracles, automated when performing the necessary duties as part of bridge and operations. And the last but not the least category of costs can be associated with the risks coverage. So this usually includes payments of some premiums to the insurance of locked assets for which we have some decentralized insurance protocols already out there. And this also includes the organization and payments in, in terms of bug bounty programs and something similar to them. If you take a look on the other side of the equation, then it's typically a big question how the bridge could try to compensate for those costs and how it could generate some revenue which will be higher than then the amount of those costs so that the bridges could become financially sustainable. And in fact, in the earlier days of Ethereum, this was typically not considered as a big problem as just every deployed bridge out there followed the simple rule of this correspondence of one EVM chain to one particular bridge. 
And so each available bridge was just considered to be a small part of some larger parent EVM network, sidechain, whatever. And so no one just really thought about how the bridges could be financially sustainable as a singular product without looking at the budget of the larger one. But the today's situation is slightly different as there are now definitely more bridges available out there and their deployments than we have unique EVM networks. And so as more and more bridges are now being created independently of this idea of parent chains, more and more bridges have been created on top of other bridges, in between of our bridges. Then now it starts to make sense for bridge developers to start considering and finding and looking for different ways of achieving and generating some revenue streams. So let's now see what approaches we have already tried at Gnosis Chain Bridges and how they performed. So far we tried three different approaches. So now we'll go just one by one and discuss briefly each of them. So the first and the most obvious approach is probably related with the bridging fees. So the idea here is simple is that similar to the way how any decentralized exchange works, we could just charge our users with a small fee on every their bridge operation. This approach works well and awesome, but there are a few things that make it way less efficient than it is in the decentralized exchanges. So the first problem here is related with the capital efficiency of the bridge. So the last time I checked the numbers at Gnosis Chain, the daily bridging volume was somewhere, sitting somewhere around 3% of the entire TVL. And if we compare that number with decentralized exchanges, you'll see that this number is typically much higher. So the last time I saw at Uniswap, it was somewhere around 25%. So that definitely impacts the amount of fees you could potentially collect from your, from your bridge operation. And the second problem here is maybe kind of psychological one and is related to this idea that in decentralized exchanges, the fee, the taken fee can be thought as a kind of a hidden one. So as typically the send and received assets that user trades are completely different, they have a volatile exchange rate between them, then it's definitely hard for user to understand what is the actual amount of value he is paying in fee. And if you compare that to the way how it works in bridges, we'll see that the fee there is much more obvious as the send and received assets are typically the representation of the same thing. So, but to summarize, yeah, this idea is still doable and it can be used to generate some profit. From the risks point of view, you may see that this usually involves some slight increase in the governance involvement in the protocol. And from the point of view, how it, it impacts the user experience, then as we already discussed, the users may consider such fees so somewhat intrusive and unattractive to them. And from our experience in the expected returns, the fees collected from the bridge operation may just be enough to prevent possible denial of service attacks on, on the bridge transactions and possibly fully or partially gather the automatically sent transaction fees. The second approach we tried, which is a much more interesting approach, is related with the compounding of the idle capital. So the main idea here is that usually how any type of the bridge currently works is that it locks some amount of assets on one side of the bridge and then unlocks or means their bridge representation on the other side of the bridge. And this, as we already discussed, the locked bridge assets have a very low capital efficiency on their own if we compare the numbers with the ones we have in lending markets, in decentralized exchanges. And so this essentially means that a large fraction of our entire TVL the bridge currently holds becomes really a, some sort of an idle capital. And the main question here is that could we find some useful way how we could delegate the usage of such idle capital to some third party protocol, which could help us to efficiently and with low risks generate some additional yield, which we can record in our profit. So let's say if the daily volume of our bridge can be covered by just 3% of our bridge TVL, this essentially means that the remaining 97% of the capital can be theoretically deployed to some third party protocol. So the easiest options here would be to just put these assets to compound finance, to our protocol, 
there is also such thing called die savings rate, which is native to MakerDAO. So it's not currently in operation, but this rate can be raised in the future if there is a need to do so. And the main idea here is that when and if our initially pre-allocated 3% buffer is being exhausted by spiking the withdrawals, then we could just seamlessly withdraw another 3% from the third party protocol and the bridge would continue to operate without any external interventions required. And as part of that, any generated interest that happens on top of the, our deployed capital can be just considered as a protocol profit and used to fund the bridge operation, the bridge costs, and whatever we discussed earlier. From the risks point perspective here, definitely we should account for risks related with the counterparty protocol we choose and use. There is also a possibility of achieving the situation when there is an insufficient liquidity for instantaneous withdrawals when we are using some kind of lending markets. So this should also be somewhat accounted for. And from the point of view of user experience, we could say that some of the users may notice the increased gas costs for their transactions, which may perform the seamless deposits and withdrawals from the lending market as part of this transaction. So this may impact the final gas costs. And some of the users also may struggle to understand how the funds are being used. And so that kind of reduces the overall on-chain transparency on where and how the funds are being stored and transferred and so on. But in the end, this approach so far is probably the best in terms of expected returns, as you can easily receive the, this nice single-digit API on the entire TVL of your bridge. So if you look at some numbers we achieved at the Gnosis chain, so since this solution was deployed in the October of last year, the entire TVL of stable coins in our bridges fluctuated somewhere around one to 200 million in stable coins. So which all of them were compounded in compounding and other protocols. And this essentially allowed our bridge to generate securely somewhere around two to 400,000 in profits throughout this month. So this included the profit in each of the stable coins plus some additional small rewards in the governance tokens which are regularly distributed to lenders and borrowers in compound and other protocols. The third and last approach we tried so far is related with the relayers. So as we already talked today, typically when completing some bridging operation, the users have to choose between either of two ways. So he can either execute some final transaction by himself and pay for the gas costs from his pocket. Or he could also ask some sort of third party relayer to execute these transactions on behalf of a user. And so if we decide to develop such kind of a relayer, then in order to make this relayer profitable, it just needs to take some fee from the user which should be larger than the expected gas cost of the same transaction. And there is also this nice way of ensuring that only profitable transactions for the real area are being eventually included on chain, which is just by using the EMV bundles. So if we wrap the specifically crafted transaction at the EMV bundles, we can ensure that only profitable real area transactions are being eventually mined and included in the Ethereum blocks. The way how we, we used this approach in Gnosis, Gnosis Chain OmniBridge was related with the custom integration with the Tornado Cache Nova application. So the way how Tornado Cache Nova privacy works and how it accounts for privacy of happening withdrawals is that they just should be executed from some sort of centralized and uniform relayer, which will prevent leakage of private details of particular user. And so the way how it works in the UI is that users are free to set any relayer fee that they are willing and can potentially pay for the relayer, which will execute their transactions. And after this withdrawal request has been submitted and processed by the relayer, it just went until this fee gets high enough to cover the potential transaction costs, the minor priority payment, the direct minor payment that can happen within the EMV bundle. And once this fee becomes great enough, the relayer just generates, signs, and sends the necessary MEV bundle. And any remainder of this fee after subtracting all of these transaction costs 
we just count into this direct relayer's profit. So the awesome thing about this approach is that it doesn't have any additional risk involved in the, its implementation. It also positively influences the overall user experience as the users now start to have more options for their transaction execution. This approach could also be thought as a form of organizing gasless transactions and it generally speed up the user experience which is also always a good thing to have. So overall this approach can be thought as a very nice way of achieving risk-free earnings basically for your bridging protocol. And if you look at some particular numbers we achieved at Gnosis Chainomi Bridge with this integration, then since it's launched uh, five months ago, we have now seen that there are four independent relayers operating on those type of the bundles. They have already processed somewhere around 8,000 withdrawals from the Tornado Cash Node, which collected in total 125 ETH in total fees and uh, 32 ETH from those 125 were collected in pure release profit, which is a nice number. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kirill. Um, does anyone have any question to Kirill? Yeah? Thank you. Uh, do you do any risk assessment as for like how to deploy the, the locked funds into compound Aave, like how much do you put in compound, how much you put in Aave, like how do you do that, if at all, is like... Yeah, so on the slide I proposed that we could deploy 97% of the TVL because... No, but how, how, I mean, how do you distribute it among the different, the different protocols? Like how much do you put in compound compared to Aave, compared to other protocols maybe? So, you could theoretically try to somewhere dynamically distribute this among several protocols, but the way it currently works is that, as far as I remember, the DAI tokens have been compounded into compound, and the USDC and USDC have been put into other. Just because at the time we designed this, typically the rates for those stable coins and those protocols were higher. So this could be, of course, changed and dynamically adjusted, but for now it works just in the simplest manner as possible. Okay. Um, any more questions? No, no? Okay, thank you so much, Kirill, and thanks to Gnodis Chain for supporting this amazing event. Give it a plus. All right. Thank you.